All right, welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and it's time for five cases in five minutes, vascular imaging number two. I'm going to show each unknown case slide for about 10 seconds, and you can pause to study the images further if you'd like. I'll then review the findings, reveal the diagnosis, and move to the next case. Ready? Let's go. Case one, CT angiogram chest and abdomen. So here you can see an intimal flap within the aortic arch continuing into the descending thoracic aorta into the upper abdominal aorta to at least the level of the right renal artery here. And this is typical for a Stanford type B acute aortic dissection. So aortic dissections occur when there's a tear in the intimal layer of the aortic wall and blood enters the medial layer, forming a second blood-filled channel within the wall known as the false lumen. And most aortic dissections are seen in elderly hypertensive patients, but less commonly other causes like a penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer or underlying connective tissue disorder like Marfan syndrome might be present. So type A aortic dissections are actually more common, accounting for about 60% of dissections, and those involve the ascending aorta, and they're treated surgically due to the risk of coronary artery occlusion, aortic valve incompetence, or rupture into the pericardial sac causing cardiac tamponade. Type B aortic dissections account for about 40% of dissections, and originally they were classified as occurring distal to the left subclavian artery, but in 2014, a report was published in the journal Radiology suggesting reclassification of type B to include dissections that involve the arch but distal to the brachiocephalic artery. And type B dissections tend to be treated medically, control of the hypertension. Now, when evaluating an aortic dissection, you want to differentiate between the true and false lumen because if these are treated with an endoluminal scent graft, that graft needs to be placed in the true lumen. Now, how do you differentiate between the true and the false lumen? So typically, the true lumen is smaller in size compared to the larger false lumen, and that's because there's increased pressures in the false lumen. Also, the false lumen tends to form a beak. This is known as the beak sign. You can see this little beak here extending towards the margin of the true lumen, and that denotes the false lumen. And sometimes you'll get a little bit of thrombus formation developing in that beak. Also, you might see the cobweb sign in the false lumen where you have sheared bits of the residual media, these little ribbons that occur in the false lumen. And also the false lumen tends to be less opacified compared to the true lumen. You can see here the contrast density is a bit more in the true lumen compared to that false lumen. Here is the true lumen is bright compared to that less opaque false lumen. And you can also tell that this is an acute dissection because the intimal flap is bowed. When you have a chronic dissection, that tends to straighten out, and also the false lumen will slowly thrombose over time. And you can see here that the right renal artery is coming off of the true lumen, which is typically the case. The left renal artery often comes off of the false lumen. I didn't show that here. But you always want to check to see if the dissection flap continues into or occludes the renal arteries because you might have a renal infarct, and also if there's extension into the mesenteric vasculature. All right, case two, renal ultrasound, history of hematuria, slide one of three. Slide two of three showing spectral Doppler waveform. Slide three of three, multiphase CT kidney with MIP reformat. So this case highlights the importance of using color Doppler imaging whenever you see what looks like a cyst on a renal ultrasound, because here we have this anechoic, somewhat lobulated structure that has imperceptible walls typical for a cyst, but when we add color Doppler imaging, there's marked flow. There should be no flow within a cyst, and it's multidirectional turbulent color flow with tissue reverberation in the surrounding tissues. This is a vascular nidus. Now, when we had spectral Doppler imaging, you can see that there's quite a bit of aliasing going on here, and also we have a very high velocity, low resistance waveform. The velocity is up here, and then this is the systolic peak, and then we have the diastolic flow is very elevated here compared to normal renal arterial flow. And if we were evaluating a draining vein here, we'd see arterial pulsation consistent with AV shunting. So finally, we, here we have a multiphase CT of the kidney. This was a renal mass protocol showing a non-contrast image, a cortical medullary phase series, and then a delayed nephrographic phase. And you can see on the cortical medullary phase, which is like an arterial phase, we have this tortuous feeding artery leading to a vascular nidus here in the interpolar kidney. And you can also see that on this 3D MIP reformatted image, the tortuous feeding artery to this lobulated vascular nidus. And this would also have a draining vein. And this is a typical renal AVM, an arterial venous malformation, which is an abnormal congenital communication between arteries and veins with a vascular nidus. Compare that to an AVF, an AV fistula, which is also an abnormal communication but does not have a vascular nidus and tends to be post-traumatic and not congenital. And this case also emphasizes how a cortical medullary phase can be a nice addition to a renal mass study because technically you only need a non-contrast phase and a nephrographic phase to evaluate a renal mass, but this cortical medullary phase 
nicely demonstrates AVMs because you can't really see it on the non-contrast phase. And even on the nephrographic phase, it tends to be isodense of the blood pool and it could potentially be overlooked. So again, these tend to be congenital and can also occur in syndromes that have other AVMs like osler weber rendu syndrome, and they can occasionally cause hematuria. So it's something to look for if you're reading a CT urogram. And while most acquired AV fistulas will resolve spontaneously, most AVMs, arterial venous malformations, typically require treatment. The treatment is usually selective renal angiography with embolization. So just one final teaching point, in addition to looking for an AVM by adding color Doppler to what looks like a cyst on ultrasound, what tumor could you occasionally confuse with a cyst on ultrasound, but which will often have vascular flow? Yes, renal lymphoma. That can sometimes look like a cyst or a complex cystic lesion on ultrasound. So it's always important to add color Doppler when you're evaluating what appears to be a cyst on ultrasound. All right, next case, slide one of three, history of right renal transplant. Slide two of three, spectral Doppler waveform. Slide three of three, selective renal angiography. So you might be thinking, uh, hey, uh, Dr. Koval, you just showed us this case, but uh, just bear with me here. This is a little different. So the clue here is that this is a renal transplant. Even though we see a very similar color Doppler turbulent multidirectional flow here, causing this visible thrill or soft tissue brewy. And again, you're getting all this tissue reverberation in the surrounding parenchyma. And when we add spectral Doppler, you again see this high velocity, low resistance waveform. So again, the diastolic flow is very high. The systolic flow is very high velocity. And we're getting a bit of aliasing. And again, in this case, we would see high velocity, low resistance flow within the artery and turbulent pulsatile flow in the segmental draining vein. But what we don't have in this case is a vascular nidus. Here on this selective renal angiogram, you see that there's flow in the renal artery, but then we also have draining vein here. And we have this communication here. It's not really a nidus, though. It's more of an abnormal communication. And this is typical for arterial venous fistula within a renal transplant. So again, AVMs tend to be congenital or developmental communications between arteries and veins that have a nidus, whereas AVFs, arterial venous fistulas, have direct communication between an artery and a vein without an intervening vascular nidus. And most of these are iatrogenic, often from renal biopsy, which we'll see typically in renal transplant kidneys that are undergoing evaluation for rejection. You can also see it though with blunt or penetrating trauma and other surgical interventions, occasionally with malignancy as well. So as I mentioned before, ABFs tend to resolve spontaneously, but they might be treated if they're symptomatic or if they increase in size or become extra renal. And again, the typical therapy is usually endovascular intervention where you do selective renal angiography with embolization. And that's what was done in this case. Note, this is the pretreatment image showing the arterial flow and then the early draining vein. And then on post-embolization, we only see arterial flow. We don't see that immediate draining vein. All right, case four, slide one of two, chest x-ray with a history of line placement. Slide two of two, 3D volume rendering from a CT angiogram. So this x-ray is kind of tricky because there are numerous EKG leads overlying the patient, which makes it hard to identify lines. But you do see an endotracheal tube here and then a left apical chest tube. And then notice that there's a left subclavian Swangans catheter here, which loops up and then extends inferiorly into the heart and then out the right pulmonary artery but then continues down into the right descending pulmonary artery. So is this good positioning for a Swangad's catheter? You typically want it one centimeter lateral to the mediastinal margin, ideally not beyond the pulmonary hilum on a chest x-ray. So this is a bit too far. So the catheter was removed and the patient went on to have a CT angiogram. And you can see here's the right pulmonary artery extending down, descending pulmonary artery, and then you have this sacculation here at a distal branch. And this is a pseudoaneurysm of the pulmonary artery caused by Swangad's catheter placement. And it's a pseudoaneurysm because it doesn't involve all the layers of the arterial wall, not all the three layers. And these tend to occur at the peripheral aspect of the pulmonary arteries, usually the segmental or subsegmental arteries, and usually occur after trauma. It could be a penetrating stab wound or pulmonary arterial catheter placement with malpositioning. You can also see this occasionally in the setting of malignancy or severe infection. All right, last case. This is an ultrasound from an abdominal aortic aneurysm status post endograph repair. <laughs> 
All right, so on this transverse image here on the left-hand side, we're looking at the aneurysm sac here, and then the flow here is within the endograft, which is normal, and then you don't see any flow within the excluded aneurysm sac, which is also normal, except you have this tubular area here anteriorly that has very turbulent flow within it, and on the sagittal color image here, you can see that it's also very tubular and linear and extending outside of the aneurysm sac. So this is typical for a type 2 endoleak from inferior mesenteric artery. And you can see that the spectral Doppler waveform here has a kind of a two and fro pattern that you might see within the neck of a pseudoaneurysm because you have this retrograde diastolic flow and then you have antegrade systolic flow, retrograde diastolic flow, antegrade systolic flow. And it's kind of that bi-directional flow that's going in and out of the excluded portion of the abdominal aortic aneurysm. So if this has low pressure and the sac isn't really expanding, these will typically just be observed. But if you see the sac expanding over time, then this is usually due to a higher flow type 2 endoleak, and that will tend to be treated with embolization of the artery causing uh, collateral retrograde flow or just open surgical repair. And let me just take a minute to review the endoleak classification because this can be kind of a confusing topic. So type 1 is when you have seal failure between the aorta and the graft ends. And you see this most commonly after thoracic aortic aneurysm repair. So that's subdivided into type 1A, which is proximal. Type 1B occurs at the distal aspect of the graft. And then 1C is when it occurs at an iliac occluder. So for abdomen, you can remember this by above, below, and C. There's a C in iliac. Type 2 is when you have retrograde filling of the excluded sac from collateral flow, the lumbar artery or inferior mesenteric artery most commonly as in this case. And this type is most common after abdominal aortic aneurysm repair. And this can be subdivided into type 2A when there's a single vessel, like in this case, or type 2B when there are multiple vessels, like if you have a lumbar artery and the IMA causing retrograde filling. Type 3 is when you have actual gaps between the graft component or if there's a tear in the graft. So 3A is when you have junctional separation of the components of the graft, whereas 3B is if you actually have a fracture or a hole in the endograft, which is much less common. And then type 4 is when there's porosity of the graft. Finally, type 5 endoleaks are known as endotension, where we see the aneurysm sac increasing in size but without an identifiable cause. Some argue whether this endoleak type even exists. Are these just unicorns? <laughs> But they're probably actually slow flow type 2 or type 3 endoleaks that we're just not seeing on routine imaging. All right, that's it for five cases in five minutes, vascular imaging number two. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and if so, please subscribe to Radiologist Headquarters on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. It would be brilliant if you shared these lectures with even just one person or left a podcast review. You can also leave a comment or a question on YouTube, and I'll do my best to answer it. Visit us at radiologisthq.com for more info and to follow us on social media to get updates. Thanks, and have a great day.